algae are really good at growing on nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon dioxide. And nitrogen and phosphorus are usually found in wastewater streams and carbon dioxide we produce by doing literally everything that we do. So you can see the incredible value in this low energy, a uh, low value into higher value uh, production that we can do with algae. Okay, great. Awesome. Thank you so much, Diana. Um, and welcome everybody to another edition of Valley Dow Science Spotlights. I know that there are some familiar faces here that have probably heard this all before, uh, but I know that there's lots of new faces as well. So really warm welcome to all of you and really looking forward to this session. Um, so just a quick um, overview on Valley Dow as an organization. So we are a global community of synthetic biology researchers. Uh, investors and enthusiasts who are collectively funding research in climate, food security and sustainable development. Um, and so one of the things that I would like to point out, um, if any of you are working in the microalgae space in particular, uh, is that we are super interested in receiving project applications in this space um, wow. and looking at all of the, the kind of work that you guys are doing already. Um, so if you are interested in receiving funding from an organization like Valley Dow, we do also offer translational support. I'm going to post a link to our website in the chat um, and feel free to go and visit our website. Um, but if you're not looking for funding in particular and you would just like to be a part of the community, then we have plenty of space for that as well. We have lots of different initiatives that we run um, and various working groups that you can get involved in. So again, head on over to our website to find out a little bit more about those. And uh, you can make an application there to become a contributor to one of these growth groups. Um, so other than funding and the translational side, uh, we obviously host events, which is the reason we've brought you all here today. Uh, so the format of this event uh, and these events in particular are generally we, we have a, a guest speaker who's going to come and speak for a little, little while. And then we will have a open Q&A. Um, so there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end of this session. If you do have any burning questions uh, during the uh, call, please uh, please do stay muted and pop them in the chat and we'll pick them up at the end when we get to the question time, as Deanna said. Um, so without further ado, that's all you'll hear from me for now. Um, and I would like to warm welcome to Kyle uh, to the stage who is going to be our guest speaker today. So I don't think I need to, to give him an introduction. He's got uh, some, some really awesome work to be showing all of us today. Um, and yeah, just really looking forward to hearing what he's got to share with us. So welcome everybody. And Kyle, uh, I think I would request you to unmute. Okay, great. Can you hear me? Yes, see yep. some thumbs up, perfect. Share my screen. Oh, but host disabled participant screen sharing. So, step one. Yeah, <laughs> just I can I, think I can just, just you know it. dance my slides if you want. There we go. Okay, you can see PowerPoint. Yep. Seeing everything. Great. I close these meeting controls. Beautiful. Okay. Thanks for the invite. Um, I understand that this is a very diverse community of synthetic biologists. And I'm taking the opportunity to treat this much less like a webinar or a seminar that I would give and more like a, a lecture that I would give to students in our university. And I see that there are actually some members of our university who have logged in. Uh, you can, I can see your names in the, in the participant chat. So that's cool. Hi, everybody. Great to see you. And uh, one of our former visiting students is also there, so fantastic. Um, so my name is Kyle. I'm a assistant professor at KAUST, which is short for King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. And we're here on the coast of the Red Sea in Saudi Arabia. And our lab is an algal biotechnology lab with the name Sustainable and Synthetic Biotechnology Group. So in the region, there aren't many people doing what we're doing. As you can imagine, the development of science and technology is a relatively recent phenomenon in the Arabian Peninsula. And there are a few other labs that have small algae collections or focus on sequencing and genomics of um, local species of algae. But ours is really the only hardcore algal biotechnology lab that does the full spectrum of technologies related to this field. And so I always tell people we're kind of specialized generalists. 
And by that, I mean, we have to cover every aspect of the spectrum of technologies involved in uh, microbial biotechnology, alternative biotechnology, um, and, and that sort of thing. So we do everything from finding new species and creating a living library of algae from the, the Arabian Peninsula to trying to engineer those with synthetic biology to do things that they don't normally do. And then once we have those cells engineered to do things they don't normally do, we have to talk about bioprocess design and how do we actually um, make bioreactors that allow us to get those products out of those cells. And then because of our unique geography here, we uh, it's not entirely unique. There's lots of deserts all over the world, but because of our specialized uh, geography, we talk a lot about resource cycling and where we're going to get the inputs to do biotechnology to get the outputs we want. And then those ge geographical considerations. So a little pitch about Kaos. We are a small city that's parked right on the coast of the Red Sea. And the city is the campus. So the whole university, the whole city is a university. And there's about 8,000 residents, uh, 200 faculty, about 1,500 students. And we only have master's and PhD students. If you are interested in coming to KAUST for up to six months, we have a visiting student research program, which is really, really the best way to come, get some experience here, and then decide if it's the right fit for you. And we're really looking for bachelor's and master's students that could come either be master's or PhD students. So we've had some very uh, successful visiting students in the past, one of whom is in the audience, you can ask him later. Um, and we have two visiting here right now, which are uh, fantastic students. So these are some photos of our beautiful campus. And geographically, we're located about an hour's drive north of Jeddah with not much around us. But surprisingly, Jeddah is one of the most well-connected airports in the world. So for example, you can fly to LA in 16 hours. You can fly to Singapore, London, um, Frankfurt, Paris, and uh, Amsterdam, all direct flights. So it's, it's really well-connected and it's uh, not as far away from home as you might think it is. Now, I'm sure all of you have some preconceived notions of what Saudi Arabia might look like. And these photos are um, sort of typical of what you might see around the kingdom. And of course we think, oh, this is a barren desert place. It's very dry, very inhospitable. And indeed it's it's very hot in the summer. I'm, I'm not going to lie, it's, it's uh, very uncomfortable in the summer temperature wise, but in the winter, it's actually perfect. It's about 20 to 25 degrees and sunny and low humidity. So the way we talk about it is that we have the season where you have to shower once a day and the season where you have to shower two to three times a day. And that's basically how we think about the weather. There's hot and not hot seasons. But just to contrast that, this is my backyard and my backyard is very green. And so it's not like photosynthesis doesn't function even in these extreme heats. It's just that really water management is a big part of how we can manipulate and manage um, the, the natural world around us here. So a lot of what you'll see in terms of gardening is very artificial imported plants. And I think the idea of sort of an endemic plant um, ecosystem is, is pretty much out the window at this point, but from an artificial synthetic biology point of view, it's actually kind of neat because it's a completely uh, built world and with the right management, it's actually a fantastic place to grow things. So here in the kingdom, we look at ourselves as having the perfect conditions for algal biotechnology. We have a lot of um, solar energy, as you can imagine. We have proximity to water on the coasts, uh, salt water, and we have unexplored algal diversity in the Red Sea, as well as the terrestrial environment. And we have a lot of unused land, as you can see here, just outside the campus, this big flat area of land. That's pretty typical for what is around the built environment. So these are great opportunities to build algal biotechnology. And of course, at KAUST, we have four main topic, topical themes, food, water, energy, and environment. And now that's been expanded to health and digital as well. And that's what our emblem here sort of is meant to represent. But from the algal biotechnology space, what we're looking to do is bring these technologies where we can cultivate algae, use the freely available resources, and convert waste into higher order chemical value. So these are different versions of photobioreactors that you'll see from around the world. In the top left, you have tubular photobioreactors. Uh, bottom left, you have what are called green wall panels, hanging bags in the upper right. 
and a, an open pond that's basically a kiddie pool that's been turned into a bubbling uh, pool of Nanochloropsis alga or algae. Now, most of you won't have experienced at any time in your life purified alkyl biomass other than maybe buying spirulina and chlorella tablets from your local nutraceutical uh, store. But what they look like at the end of the day is a biomass that is freeze dried. It's a powder. It's, it's very similar to if you went and bought yeast at the grocery store to bake bread with, except obviously it has photopigments. So it's different, different colors. And every species that you grow will have a different physiological composition of chlorophyll content, carotenoid content, fatty acid content, uh, proteins, and, and all of these different things. So what I, I love to tell people is that the diversity of algae is so vast and so underexplored. And for example, it's not, um, it's not phenotypically the way you might imagine, right? So chlorella, Dunneliella, and hematococcus are three different species of green algae, but you can see they're not all green, right? And this is because of the different accumulation of carotenoid pigments in the different cells and the loss of chlorophyll under different growth stages. But they also have variations, not only in pigmentation, but the oil content or the protein content or the specialty, um, specialty polysaccharides they might make in their cell wall. And so as a, as a bioproduct, there's so much room to explore here, so many applications that we haven't really touched on. Now, the real value is in converting waste inputs into these higher value chemicals. And algae are really good at growing on nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon dioxide. And nitrogen and phosphorus are usually found in wastewater streams and carbon dioxide we produce by doing literally everything that we do. So you can see the incredible value in this low energy, uh, low value into higher value uh, production that we can do with algae. So this slide uh, represents one of the initiatives that's happening in the kingdom. And this is funded by the local uh, government Ministry of Environment, Water and Agriculture, abbreviated as MIWA. And in the upper left, what you can see is an upside down Arabian Peninsula from our normal orientation and green dots that localize different industrial or human activities that are producing some kind of waste stream, whether it's carbon dioxide or uh, a waste water with nitrogen and phosphorus in it. And so these are identified places where outdoor algal production would make sense along the coasts of Saudi Arabia. And so you can see we have a small pilot facility here. You have several 25,000 liter raceway ponds, three different uh, tubular photobioreactors of 1,000 liters. And they're in the process of building a 4.2 hectare facility. This, these photos are a little bit old now. The raceway ponds are actually there and they're massive. It's actually really impressive to stand by them. So this is being run by a guy named Dr. Claudio Fuentes Grunwald, who used to be in Swansea University in the UK. And he's now uh, here at Kaus for the last two years, very aggressively um, pursuing this. Now I will say this is not part of my lab, but we heavily collaborate with them. And one of the things that we do is we support these initiatives by building our bioprospecting library of algae isolated from the kingdom for the kingdom. Now there's something called the Nagoya protocol, which means anything isolated since uh, 2014 uh, now has problems in getting shared country to country. And so what we're trying to do is really develop these resources as a local bio resource from this country for this country. So we're not importing microorganisms to grow in big raceway ponds outdoors. You can just see some illustrative examples of some of the algae that we've isolated. They're going through um, sequencing now and we're doing some basic biochemical characterizations of them and growth characterization. So this is a, an ongoing project we've had for the last year and a half. These are the sampling locations we've had so far and we still have so much more to go. The Southern part and the Eastern part have yet to be sampled, but we have over 80 isolates already. And this is an accessible bank from the kingdom for the kingdom, as I mentioned. But we, what we're really concerned about is figuring out which ones of them have biotechnological value in their biomass and in their growth behaviors. And we can do this because our lab has one of the best infrastructures for doing algal biotechnology, I think, in the world. We have on site 32 of these photo bioreactors. So in this photo or this video, you can see 20 of them uh, doing their job here. 
And each one is a contained environment with controlled light, temperature, and gassing. So you can control the pH by injecting more CO2. We program them with local weather station data so that we can model performance across the year in uh, on the Red Sea coast for now, but we can do it for any location. And the idea here is that we have control culture, another control culture with day and night cycling, and then we have one for each of the seasons, spring, summer, winter, and fall. And that allows us to predict, oh, that strain is gonna be well performing in the colder months or in the hotter months. And so you can see here, the cyanobacterium does not like February. Whereas this green alga that we've isolated is pretty good even in May and August when the temperatures are consistently 38 degrees or higher, especially in the, in the middle of the day. Um, so uh, here on the coast, I should say that we have much more moderate temperatures because of the, our proximity to the Red Sea. So it never really gets above 40 degrees and high humidity. Whereas in the center of the kingdom, it's much more like the Arizona desert where you'll have these spikes of heat in the day up to 55, 60, and then back down to 35 overnight. So um, that kind of environmental modeling is very, very important. Now, if you need to look at these, uh, this information, this QR code will take you to this downloadable PDF and we update it every couple of weeks whenever we have new data. So we accumulate all of the knowledge we have from these different strains. Um, and after we grow them, we're able to take the little biomass samples that we get and do some basic um, biochemical analysis on them. So protein, carbohydrates, and lipids. And we're going through systematically and trying to fill in this, this data for each one, in addition to doing some basic sequencing to try and figure out their, their identity. So this is really the first time that all of these elements have come together in the kingdom. Normally, you could buy a few different strains like the ones I showed you photos of from suppliers that might be in Europe or in China, and you could buy them in, in the kilogram quantity like you see here. But for our new strains, what we get after a growth curve is some freeze-dried biomass from each of the different reactors that we can then do that biochemical characterization on. And so this is really important for us because now we can say what strains might actually be valuable, whether you need to grow them in the winter or the summer, or whether we can predict if they're, they're going to die under certain conditions. And we've already been showing how we can translate this. So this is one of those green algae that we isolated called uh, Tetradesmus. And we were able to grow it uh, outdoors earlier this year, or the team outside was able to grow it earlier this year and already get a couple kilograms of freeze-dried biomass. And you know this this kind of translation from small scale to large scale happens very infrequently uh, around the world. It's it's very rare that all of these elements are in the same place. There's some good labs in Brazil that do this, and uh, scattered around the world, there's lots of algal biotechnology labs. It's just that um, we never had one until about two years ago here. So my lab is four years old. And the outdoor team is uh, really a year and a half since they've been operational. So this has been incredibly exciting for us and, and we're excited to see where it goes. What was also really interesting for me is that these stories started popping up in the local news. So you can see three different newspapers here. And um, what's really funny is that they journalistically did not ask for really that much input from us or any at all. So we kept seeing the same story popping up but it was always slightly rephrased. So if you read it and say, hey, that doesn't sound right, that wasn't me, I didn't, I didn't write that. <laughs> but it is kind of cool that it's getting some attention. So as I mentioned, algae are really good at converting low value products into higher value chemical resources or chemical value. And um, you can see that illustrated here, carbon dioxide or waste carbon. Some algae can grow, eat uh, the organic carbon in wastewater, for example trace minerals, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, and they grow in water with some sunlight. And you get all of these wonderful products out. But that's fine and great and, and good, but I'm more concerned about how do we make that value even greater by adding in recombinant products. And so, of course, the basic principle, like any metabolic engineering that we want to talk about, is that you take some kind of pathway that comes from a plant and you adapt it and put it into an alga and you start producing that same or similar um, chemical in your algae and then it's a scalable source of that product that, that you can use. Now I want to illustrate algal biotechnology for a second for you just because it is quite diverse in what you can do. And this is a multi-dimensional engine, uh, multi engineering space. 
So just think about a flask of algae for a second. You have the secreted stuff in the uh, supernatant and you have the biomass. And in that supernatant, you don't just have clean water, you actually have a lot of secreted cellular uh, products or extracellular proteins. And in that biomass, you don't just have biomass, you have soluble and insoluble products, right? So you can separate different chemical fractions from these different part, uh, parts of the biomass. You can also think about the air above the flask for engineering volatile products. And this is something I'm gonna tell you about. This is an example of when you concentrate down a volume about this much of uh, an algal culture. If you have a kilodalton cutoff filter, you can get this goo on the retentate side and your clean water will come through on the permeate side. But this goo itself can be a product that we just haven't really explored it very much, but normally it would be thrown away and people wouldn't think about it. But you can also engineer the production of other products and products that may secrete from the cells or products that need to be milked with solvents. So in my career, uh, I've been able to successfully show the engineering of chlamydomonas specifically, but now also cyanidios guys on Marole to produce a lot of different specialty chemicals and products. We've been able to produce diterpenes, sesquiterpenes, platform chemicals like isoprene, another sesquiterpene here. We were able to modify chlamydomonas and cyanidios guys on pigmentation to produce the red pigment astaxanthin. We were able to modify fatty acid composition as well as change uh, or secrete recombinant proteins from the alga into the extracellular space. Now, this work spans multiple institutions and has many different collaborators. So uh, I did quite some of it in my postdoc at the University of Bielefeld. Here at KAUST, we've done quite some work. And I'm also a, an adjunct professor at Arizona State University at the ASCADI facility, the Arizona Center for algal technology and innovation. And they've been driving really our red algal engineering, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit later. So Chlamydomonas reinhardii is a model alga. It's been in the lab since 1940. And people like working with it because it's just simply very easy to grow. You can set it on a shelf at room temperature with some light and in its medium, it will grow and you can do a physiological analysis. It can consume acetic acid or CO2 or both it's pretty high light tolerant, doubles every six to eight hours, and is just generally fantastic to work with. But it's also a strain that's been highly domesticated. So it's been in the lab so long that different strains exist that have knocked out cell wall, uh, have different properties. And that matters when we're talking about trying to do biotechnology with algae, because when we do genetic engineering, we actually have to do a lot of high throughput handling, as you can see in these plates here. So a wild type fresh isolate has a cell wall. It's not easy to pick. It's not easy to grow on plates because it has a dry sort of uh, colony. And if you touch it with a, a toothpick, the colony breaks instead of going onto the toothpick. But more domesticated strains like this UV mutant that came from the MPI in Potsdam, UVM4, it has a goopy phen uh, phenotype and you can pick it and robots can pick it and that allows it to grow. It also doesn't stick on plastic when you're uh, culturing it. So you can do high throughput micro titer plates. And uh, as I mentioned, we can also do robotic picking, which is illustrated with these plates here. So that matters a lot for genetic engineering in this organism. And I'm going to show you why in a second. The only way we've been able to do the kind of engineering that we do is because I came to this field at a time when DNA synthesis became reasonably affordable. And that already was now more than 10 years ago, but it is a, a, a requirement for getting the plasmids that we need optimized to work with the host algal regulation machinery in a very specific way. And I'm gonna to talk to you about that in a second, but like all synthetic biologists, we look at DNA as something that we can plan for and code in silico and then build, and then we're ready to go. And this is, you know, we have to appreciate, this is really a novel concept. And I think it's where engineering biology is, is quite exciting moving forward for the next 10, 10, 20, 50 years, whatever. 
So over the last uh, eight years, we've built many different Plasma toolkits and have optimized them. So we're on the third generation of this toolkit called P-Optimized, which is kind of like a, a bulldozer plasmid. It's great. It has each element um, separated by unique restriction sites, which is kind of old school, but it works really, really well if you want to, for example, fluorescently tag a thousand proteins, because with the MoCo uh, kit, what you have to do is you have to put your protein in a level zero, then a level one, then a level two, before you can actually transform it. And so different plasmid toolkits actually have different uh, hands-on applications. And we use both of them. We actually, in my lab, use the MoClo toolkit quite a lot less because we have, most of our constructs are systematically testing different genes less than the regulatory elements. But if you're doing regulatory elements, then the MoClo toolkit is, is very useful. Now, when we're talking about nuclear engineering and chlamydomonas, we have to be aware that it behaves differently than every other eukaryote you've ever worked with. And the summary of this is basically like this. If you have an antibiotic selection marker, you can express a very small amount of that transgene and get selection, so that works. And if you have a fluorescent reporter, you can express a very small amount of it and see it, and that works. But if you have a transgene that's over 1 kb or even over about 700 kb, the cell doesn't express it very well. And so that doesn't work. And most of the metabolic engineering genes that we want to work with are larger than 1 kb. So this was a real problem for us. And I'm going to summarize five hard years of postdoc time with myself and Dr. Thomas Beyer at the University of Bielefeld with this next slide. So what we figured out is that if you look at a large transgene, and you don't have any introns in it, you don't get any expression. But if you spread endogenous introns to mimic the way that introns are spread in a natural gene, what happens is the cell thinks that that gene is its own. And so this is a level of regulation on a gene from the nuclear genome that's very chlamydomonas specific. And so we figured out that you need an intron every 450 to 500 base pairs or so for there to be actually enough mRNA to then make enough protein. And if you take away any one of those introns and have a larger gap, that expression goes away again. So this is something that we, we figured out um, back in 2015. And then it stimulated a lot of development in this space because all of a sudden we went from not being able to express anything to being able to express almost anything we wanted to a relatively high level. Of course, in chlamydomonas, we don't have uh, finely regulated promoters. We don't have um, a lot of nuanced development in, in transgene design. We're really just brute force over expressing things to then cause a metabolic effect in the cell. And that works for us because we're not trying to do things that we're doing with yeast, but we are trying to convert carbon dioxide into our final product. Now, I know that as biologists, we tend to be a little bit lazy sometimes. And one of the things we did is we made this interface where you could drop in an amino acid sequence and the interface would give you out a completely codon optimized and intron spread sequence following the rules that we created or discovered so that you could then just send that to a gene synthesis company and have a ready to go expression cassette. So we made this uh, relatively easy for the community, the chlamydomonas community, and it's worked out pretty well for us. So that was already back five years ago now, four years ago now, um, and it's been used quite heavily by the community. So just another uh, small note, the genes when they go into the chlamydomonas genome go in randomly. They do not go in by very efficient homologous recombination unless you do a Cas9 directed cut and then have a very specifically designed uh, over, overhang, uh, which has only recently been shown. But generally the DNA goes into the genome completely randomly by non-homologous end joining. And so if you have a YFP construct, great. You get about 50% of your colonies expressing YFP, and then there's variability uh, in that population. But if you have a larger terpene synthase, what ends up happening is that that gets broken as it's going into the genome and you have variable expression, you don't have uh, so many colonies in your population. And so for that, we've really tried to optimize our screening with chlamydomonas. We have robotic picking, thankfully, uh, due to the investments from KAUST. And you can see the Singer pixel on the left working here and the rotor on the right. And we're able to then just really increase our screening efforts and make that a little bit 
more humane because in my postdoc time, I was that robot picking with um, toothpicks and listening to podcasts, which, you know, had its own value, I guess. But uh, now we can at least do it eight times faster without, without any human error. So that's really, really nice. So our standard workflow looks like this. You transform, you spread some cells on a plate, you get colonies back in some density. This is not a good transformation. This is almost too good. So, you know, this is probably the best kind of transformation you're gonna get. Robot picking, robot stamping, and then what's the deal with these dark blue plates? Well, we use a, a mixture of amido black in our agar, and amido black is an old protein stain. And we do that to reduce the autofluorescence from the agar in fluorescent screening. So you can see here the same plate uh, stamped with or without amido black, and you can see the expression of LSS M orange, long stoke shifted M orange here. When you stimulate agar with anything blue light or below, it has a lot of autofluorescence. And that's, you can barely see the expression here. So this really helps with fluorescent screening. And of course you can see that that can be multiplexed and we can take images of uh, whole plates much better this way. Now um, we use fluorescence because of this non-homologous end joining to isolate transformants at the plate level. And of course that is a limitation of the system, but it sure beats doing Western blot for hundreds of clones at any one time. And so because we use fluorescence so much, one of the things we've done is looked at ways that we can optimize it. So you can see here, this is a, a gel doc that we've optimized with filters for excitation and emission to look at different fluorophores. And we can then take a picture of a whole plate. You can achieve the same thing, for example, with a uh, typhoon scanner or um, actually a typhoon scanner is probably the only other thing you can use to get that kind of image. But one of the things I was concerned about was how do we go across the spectrum of light in our system? And it turns out that with the right filter sets, very narrow bandpass cutoffs, you can actually isolate at about a 20 or 30 nanometer gap walking up the spectrum. Now, each fluorophore has a different kind of spread of emission, and you can see that illustrated here. But what we figured out is that we could actually pretty reliably separate about four different fluorophores at the same time to allow this high throughput plate screening. So what you see at the top here is a uh, white light of the amino black plate. Whoops, sorry, that automatically went. And then the red here is the autofluorescence from chlorophyll. And so if you stimulate um, algal cells or plant cells with any kind of blue light or red light, you get red autofluorescence. And that red autofluorescence is here, you can see in chlorophyll A and B. And what we really were able to show is that with using the right filter here, even butting up right against the chlorophyll B, we could separate M Neptune from the chlorophyll signal here. So this was a nice paper because it was more just a proof of concept that we could do it, but it's very, very useful. If you wanna stack genes in our organism, transforming one fluorophore, then another, then another infusion to your genes allows you to identify them on the plate level very quickly and get them into the next steps of screening. So one of the other things about domestication is that you want to minimize contamination. And what we were able to do is take the phosphite oxidoreductase gene from Saul Purton and put it into the chloroplast genome. I don't have time to go into the details here, but the chloroplast has its own genome, which you can express transgenes from. It's not as uh, easy to work with as the nuclear genome now, but it does work. And what we were able to do is also complement this domesticated strain's ability to grow on nitrate by giving it back its original genes for nitrate metabolism. Now, the reason this is important is algal cells grow in very dilute way in liquid. And to get more cells, you have to put more stuff in your medium for their, them to grow on. And normally, ammonium is used as a preferred nitrogen source. But ammonium, when it's consumed, releases a hydrogen ion and causes the medium to become acidic. So if you want high-density algal cultures, you need to grow cells on nitrate. And that's what you can see here. So this is acidified crashed culture, whereas this is a nitrogen, uh, nit nitrate containing uh, medium. We did this in a strain uh, that was already domesticated and we then optimized its name and it's now called UPN22. This strain also we engineered to produce uh, a, a terpene, but I'm not gonna go into that in too much detail here. So just to show you that when we did this, 
what we were doing was engineering the cell to grow on nitrate, but also phosphite. And so phosphite is a non-bioavailable form of phosphate. And if you don't have this phosphite oxidoreductase, cells will accumulate phosphite and then starve of phosphorus and die. And what we were able to show is that we could mimic the high density medium that we made with nitrate with phosphate or phosphite. And our transformant here expressing the phosphite oxidoreductase grew just as well as the parental strain. So that was great. And that became our type strain that we used for all engineering because we can grow it pretty much without autoclaving the medium. The phosphite prevents contamination from many, many organisms, although not all. There are some uh, airborne fungi that can get in there and some other organisms so like cyanobacteria sometimes can get in there. So it's not perfect, but it does help, especially if your environment is very humid, has a lot of um, stuff in the air. You know, this, uh, this really helps your contamination. And that's illustrated here. So these are different medium uh, media recipes that Gordon Wellman is working on. And you can see with phosphate, you get this delicious accumulation of gross fungus in uh, your, your culture, whereas with phosphite, there was just none. So this is an illustrative example, but it, it works out pretty well. Now, I mentioned we were producing a natural product with this uh, paper as well. And so we were producing a perfume called patchoulol, which is a terpene. And terpenes are a massive class of natural products for plants. Now, many of these compounds have uses either as perfumes or medicines or industrial uh, inputs. But one of the things that kind of defines them is that most are hydrophobic. And being hydrophobic in a microbe is kind of challenging as a product because if you think about it, the single cell doesn't have many places for those hydrophobic products to go. So in a plant, you have specialized tissues like trichomes. If you touch a mint leaf or a sage leaf, the hairs on that leaf break and give off these chemicals onto your skin. And you can see that illustrated here, but a microbe doesn't have that. And the way we overcome that is we co-culture our cells with a solvent uh, contact. And you need a biocompatible solvent. And usually this is done with a solvent like dodecane, which is the same as hexane if you've ever used it, except it's twice the size molecularly. And that allows the cells to, um, not, to not destroy the membranes and not cause lysis of the cells. So dodecane is great, but the biggest problem with it is in an algal culture that you're bubbling CO2 in to grow the cells. And this interface between the cells and the dodecane becomes very turbid. And you end up getting what's called an emulsion because there's a lot of hydrophobic stuff coming out of the cells into the medium as well. So the cell wall proteins, all of the fatty acids that might be there, they get stuck in this dodecane when you're bubbling it and that causes a lot of problems. Not only that, dodecane is like diesel, it's flammable and not great to scale up. It also penetrates all silicon tubing, so it's even worse for uh, using uh, in, in general. So what we, what we did is we tried to come up with a way to get rid of the contact surface area and, and or sorry, to expand the contact surface area and allow us to be able to have algal culture growing in contact with the solvent. And so what you see here is an example of a hollow fiber membrane uh, which is a bunch of straws basically that have micro or nanopores that we can have solvent on one side and culture on the other. This allows us to massively increase our surface area of contact, but also keep that emulsion from forming. And so what we were able to show is that we could continuously milk this patchoulo product from algal culture over 60 days, and we could then downstream process that patchoulo product out of, of the solvent. But it's not perfect. As I mentioned, it's flammable. It doesn't do well with tubes. You need special tubing. You need special pumps. And so we were very excited to discover a different class of solvents, uh, which has been known for a long time for a lot of different applications. In fact, you use them for microfluidic droplets. And that are th those are the fluorinated solvents. So fluorinated solvents are more dense than water and sit underneath. And so normally we would call dodecane an overlay but for the F solvents, as they're called, we call that an underlay. And uh, apparently we were the first people to come up with that name, but it seemed pretty obvious to us. So this adds a new element into how we can culture the cells because now we can sparge gas in the middle of the culture, but have that interface between the fluorocarbon and the culture undisturbed. And that means we can come up with different reactor designs 
that we that I'll show you uh, an illustrative example of in a second. Now, what was surprising to us is that the fluorocarbons actually milk terpenes really well, but they're also much cleaner and more inert and safer to use than uh, these alkane solvents. So when you use dodecane, it has a lot of contaminants from the petroleum refinement process that makes it. So this is all of the peaks you see in a gas chromatograph from dodecane, and this is patchouli being made. But with fluorocarbons, they're clean, and you get clean product out. What's also very exciting is that we can then take our fluorocarbon with our product in it and mix it with ethanol. And the ethanol is immiscible in the fluorocarbon because it's, they have completely different densities. And then the terpenes prefer going into the ethanol. So we end up being able to then swap liquid liquid out the terpenes from that, that fluorocarbon. So now we have a situation where we could en envision some kind of cultivation that looks like this, where we have a bioreactor, a lower phase solvent, and then that solvent is going over mixing with ethanol, and then you're able to get your product out in a couple of steps. This is um, illustrative only. We haven't built something that is quite this simplistic, but in general, what I wanna say is that there are easy ways to get these products out. And it's really good to talk to process chemists and just general chemists because they have a lot of tricks for this sort of thing that you don't think about as a biologist. And downstream processing is actually 80% of the cost of any molecular process or any biological process that you're going to invent with your cells, right? So talk to your downstream processing people because you can then have more of an idea of what you wanna do from the cell point of view before you get to the end, end product. Now I wanna bring one example of what we've done with uh, terpenes in the local context. And for any of you that have any experience with the Middle East or people that you might know in your neighborhoods that come from the Middle East, is that there's a lot of perfume and incense used here. And one of the key ones is this um, product called Oud. And Oud is fragments of an Aquilaria tree that have been dried. Now Aquilaria trees are called agar wood colloquially, and they accumulate resin when they get wounded over a long period of time that's full of fragrant terpenes. The problem is they grow really slowly and they're now currently listed as endangered. And so these perfume products are not able to be sold in the US or Europe, mostly because they uh, are coming from an endangered species. And so together with our ragtag team of students and postdocs and the collaborators, what we did is we went and we found a bunch of samples from local markets here because they're sold just like candy is. And what we did is some analysis of the terpene content. And it turns out that across all of these, they share about 300 terpene chemicals uh, in, each in each sample. And each sample has a unique sort of biological fingerprint. And some can have up to 400, 500 different chemicals. Some are more like the 280, 290 range, but there's about 300 core uh, terpene chemicals that exist in this oud. And so we thought, hey, this is a perfect SynBio uh, activity. We're gonna try and make our alga produce this oud product or the terpenes from this oud, which give it its nice unique flavor, uh, fragrance. To do that, we had to optimize the algal cell to produce more terpenes. And this is the product of the last 10 years of knowledge that we have in engineering this organism. And you don't have to go into any of the details here, but basically what we did is we knocked down squalene synthase and we figured out that when we overproduce a red pigment, um, what's called ketocarotenoids, it sort of deregulated the whole terpene pathway. And so we ended up with cells that produce these extra red pigments as well, but the red pigments um, allow more flux to go through the terpene pigment pathway in the cells. What we were then able to do is take terpene synthases from many different species of plant and make nine different base chemicals from our alga that are found as the base chemicals in oud. And then what we were able to do is apply our terpene milking strategy, which I mentioned before. And once we had that ethanol, we coupled this with a process called organic solvent nanofiltration. And here you have a compression chamber and a membrane that has a very, 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 very fine cutoff, so nano porous size. And what that means is that molecules like the terpenes stay on the retentate side, but the ethanol goes through. And so you have an inert way to concentrate those down because if you tried to evaporate them, you would end up losing half of the product that would be volatile and going into the air.
And so we had these nine chemicals in uh, an ethanol solution, in a more concentrated ethanol solution. And it turns out that if you treat those chemicals with boron and hydrogen peroxide, you can cause chemical group functionalization by attacking the double bonds that are found in the base terpene molecules. And in that way, we were actually able to create quite a complex mixture of different terpenes from the algal cells. So um, we started with you know, the base FPP, which is the uh, precursor that's used to make all these sesquiterpenes. We made nine different chemicals, and then we hydroxyborinated them or borohydroxylated them uh, to make over 118 different chemicals in our final, final um, process. So this took nine different cell cultures, but now we have this nice sort of ready brown algal cell that's producing many different products and we're able to have a full green bioprocess because every one of these steps requires very little energy. It requires very little uh, loss of solvent. You can recycle the solvents back and use them again. And we can create a terpene mixture from, from our algae. So this is currently in preprint on BioArchive. We're waiting on the reviews. We just saw that the second review came in. So uh, wish us luck because we hope the editor and the reviewers liked it. It's, it's a very local story, but I think it has some pretty interesting relevance as uh, chemical engineering and, and green bioprocess design. So we're talking about a multidimensional engineering space, which we uh, discussed at the start of the talk, many different products that we can get out of our algal cells. And we've been talking about large scale nitrogen and phosphorus cycling, uh, nutrient cycling in, in different environments. Now, how do we marry these two ideas? One of the ways we can do this is by coupling our engineered algae to wastewater treatment. And so uh, if you're doing wastewater treatment with a technology called anaerobic membrane bioreactors, the effluent from that process is a water containing ammonium and phosphate. And so what we were able to show is that even our engineered algae could grow in this membrane effluent, even without sterilization, just by using carbon dioxide as the sole carbon source. So it was able to be the dominant organism in, in these kind of concepts. And we were also able to do solvent milking while these cells were growing on this wastewater. So this is just to show that the alga grew in all these different environmental conditions. We were able to milk our terpene products out and produce patchouli alcohol, which is the uh, patchouli perfume of, of patchouli plant. So in this case, you know, we're really literally taking toilet water and producing a perfume with it. So if you ever read Eau de Toilette again, I hope you think about us, but not, um, you know, don't associate us too much with toilets, but I think it's a really cool sort of overall practical concept for combining a real uh, process that we need wastewater treatment with getting specialty products out. There's some other details like we were able to strip the, the CO2 away from the mixed CO2 and methane gas stream and we made an algal biomass and got clean water out. So all good things. This is really how we're uh, marrying all of these different concepts. We've also been able to produce volatile isoprene and I've been talking at you for a long time so I'm going to rush through this a little bit but the point is that in, under the same way, we wanna make clean water biomass and a volatile product. And we're able to do this because we're able to grow the cells in sealed vials that can go directly into a headspace analyzer gas chrom chromatograph here. So growing them on acetic acid instead of CO2, the cells respire and then reconsume all of their CO2. So you get 100% carbon into your biomass. And then the cells grow just just find this way in light and you can drop them directly into this uh, measurement device and then see how much isoprene you're producing in the headspace. We were able to screen many different plant isoprene synthases and we were able to show that one produced really well isoprene over the others and this one is from sweet potato surprisingly. It apparently needs to produce a lot of isoprene for some reason and through two different rounds of engineering we were able to optimize the algal metabolism we figured out that we could make keto carotenoids at the same time and channel more carbon through isoprene with this isomerase, which led us to produce over 360 milligrams per liter isoprene when we only gave it one gram of, per liter of acetic acid. So that's a 35%, 36% carbon conversion rate. And that's pretty exciting, I think, if, uh, and, and we're currently working on doing this now with CO2 with headspace analysis. So the future of algal biotechnology requires 
more innovation, higher density culture, like this membrane uh, bioreactor that gives gas from CO2 below, but also ones that couple multi-products into that biomass. So we have a lot of different products that we can make uh, in that cell. And the idea is then to make sort of a biorefinement process where you're engineering four or five products at once from, from your algal biomass that's growing on, in, in the best case scenario, literal poop water, right? Um, just a quick shout out, Dr. Thomas Beyer earlier this year figured out that you could not only make a little bit of this red pigment, but you could focus the cell to make more of the red pigment by combining two different genes. If you haven't read this paper, you probably should. It has some really, really pretty pictures like this one here in it. Okay, one last topic before we wrap up, and that is the extreme temperatures of our environment. And um, I think given the global trends in environment that extreme temperatures are going to continue to be a thing everywhere. Here in the Arabian Peninsula, you can see our average summer temperatures are quite high, 46, this is degrees Celsius for anyone who's in America. Sorry, we don't have Fahrenheit. Um, but you can see there's variability throughout the seasons, but it is quite hot in the summer. And so what we started doing is looking for organisms that could grow in these hot environments, but also be new candidates for genetic engineering. And I have to say that I became attracted to these organisms because of their very simple genomes first, but they also happen to fit the niche of hot uh, environments. And so the cyanidiophyceae are eukaryotic red algae that come from sulfur and acidic hot springs globally. You find them all around the world. Uh, the most known ones are from Yellowstone National Park. And there are three species, but uh, three different genera, but we work really with cyanidioskyzon and with Galdiaria most. So they grow between 42 and 60 degrees and pH zero to two, they're happiest. So we're talking about really hot lemon juice or Coca-Cola. You know that your tooth dissolves in Coca-Cola, but these algae like growing there. And so they're optimal for our extreme environment. They don't contaminate very easily. And much like I mentioned about the, the waste, um, sorry, the ammonium, most wastewater nitrogen is ammonium. And so if you have high strength wastewater, you need an organism that can tolerate the pH crash that's gonna happen as that's consumed. And that's these organisms for sure. So they also have very small genomes, which I'm gonna to touch on very briefly. But most importantly, you can handle them like Chlamydomonas. So they grow really well in the lab. They're very easy to grow and have uh, just fantastic properties to work with as model species, but also as potentially interesting for biotechnology. So with cyanidioskies on Marole, we've over the last two years developed molecular tools. We've shown metabolic engineering and we've even shown it growing outdoors here in the kingdom. I don't have time to go into all of the details, but again, DNA synthesis allowed us to rapidly make a whole plasmid cassette similar to the PIOP plasmid. We were able to make green algal genes for the ketolase pathway. We were able to optimize a transformation protocol. And in literature, this was about four weeks to a few months to get isolated transformants. We got this down to about two weeks. So that's a reasonable amount of time to do iterative cycling for synthetic biology. And we can characterize that. You can see here, there's a lot of PCR to characterize the genetics. And what we were able to show is that we could convert the carotenoids from their native carotenoids into these new keto carotenoids. And this worked in the red algal cell using green algal genes. So you can see different isolates here from different plasmids have sort of a phenotype change in their early culture. But really in this thin layer chromatography, you see these new red pigments showing up. And you don't really need to remember the details, just that with one gene, you get mostly these intermediates, canthexanthin and adenorubin. But if you put two genes in, the beta-ketolase and uh, what's called a hydroxylase, you get the final product, astaxanthin, here. Now, why is this important? Astaxanthin is the red pigmentation that makes flamingos, shrimp, and salmon pink. It bioaccumulates in the food chain. And so if you're producing shrimp in a farm, which is not a great idea, but it's what's done globally, those shrimp are usually gray because they don't have this from their natural environment. But if you give them a little bit of astaxanthin, they turn nice and pink. So consumer acceptance is higher. So these are one of the reasons. It's also an incredible antioxidant. It's the world's strongest antioxidant, has a lot of fine chemical applications, blah, 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 blah. It's a good pigment to have, it's, uh, but it's also a great synthetic biology 
visual story that we can then talk about um, engineering. So now we've been able to show engineering in this extremophile red alga. And as I mentioned before, insoluble and soluble products. And so you can see here, it accumulates this nice blue phycocyanin, just like cyanobacteria and red algae do. You have in a wild type, the insoluble products like zeaxanthin. With one gene, you get canthexanthin. With two genes, you get astaxanthin. And you also have chlorophyll if you want that. So these are different products that can come from the same organism with some subtle modifications. And again, it's hot in the summer here. So just so that I can show you, we really do care about that. We were able to grow Cyanidios Gaison at 3000 liters outdoor in August, uh, 2022. And you can see that here, 2022 or 2021. I can't remember now, it's been so long. Anyways, it doesn't matter. It was published this year in 2023. I think we grew it outdoors in 2022. Pretty sure it was last year. And you can see it's doing really well in this relatively extreme environment where the average temperature was about 40 degrees every day, midday, higher than that, at night, a little bit colder. So I've been talking at you for 52 minutes and I apologize for how uh, rambly I've been, but I've tried to take you on a journey from where we start bioprospecting and harnessing to engineering microbial cell factories to bioprocess design, how we actually think about building reactors and what that matters in a geographical context for resource cycling. If you want any of the papers from my talk, take a screenshot, this QR code will take you to our lab website and there you'll be able to download all of the papers or get a link to an open access of all of our papers. This is the QR code again here in case you missed it. I'd like to thank everybody from my group as well as our international collaborators in um, Germany, Thomas Beyer, Dr. Olaf Kruse, uh, my former PI, as well as our uh, collaborators at ASCADI. And with that, I think I've talked at you enough and I'm open to all of your questions. I can't hear anybody. Yeah, Deanna, do you want to um, read out some questions? Oh, I think you, um, let me try and unmute you again. Yeah, Sorry. okay, cool. It worked now. There we go. Yeah, for some reason, I can't unmute myself. Thank you so much, Dr. Larson. That was an incredible presentation. I think I think it's really rare to see labs that have like the bench top level, but then also the scale up level. So, and also such a variety of, of projects was really, really in interesting and inspiring. Right, so we'll go on with, uh, the questions here in the chat. So oh, if you want to unmute yourself and ask, you can, but I can also just read it out. Uh, yeah, just to just to also caveat that and say that everybody is on like a, a mass mute at the moment. So if you do want to unmute and ask a question, uh, please raise your hand and then I'll come and unmute you. Um, it's just to keep things uncluttered. Okay, so I'll just read out the question. So from Mohammed from University of Exeter, working on diatoms and um, also looking at, uh, and is glad that algae can be used for the perfume industry. So his question is, um, if F solvents are used for an underlay are stable at different extraction temperatures, are they recyclable? Are they toxic to microalgal recombinant microalgae growth? Um, fantastic question. So there are literally dozens of different types of F solvents out in the world. They've been made for many, many years uh, by chemical industry. They also have a bad rep because the chlorofluorocarbons that are used in dry cleaning and diluted the ozone layer are gaseous fluorocarbons that are hard to get rid of. But what we're talking about are large molecule hydrocarbons that uh, are liquid at standard atmosphere temperature and, and pressure. You can sort of tailor your temperature um, requirements to the F solvent that you use. So some of them evaporate at 10 degrees, some evaporate at 40 degrees, some at 200 degrees. So you have to choose one that doesn't evaporate anywhere near the temperature that you're working with. Um, they, they are generally very, very inert molecules. And so the best part about them is that they, unlike alkane solvents, aren't reacting with the things you're extracting. And so um, in, um, <laughs> If you uh, look at cannabinoid oil, there's a patent for extracting the 
terpenes from cannabis using compressed F solvent gases in a chamber, stripping all the cannabinoids and then releasing the F gas and having the cannabinoids left over. And the reason for that is that it just doesn't react to the terpenes. So um, in our case, it's the same thing, except we have a liquid liquid extraction that's not using any pressure. It's at room temperature. It's just out on a bench. Um, and so, yeah, they're, they're really safe chemicals to work with if you choose the right ones. Um, and then are they recyclable? Yes. So once you do your cultivation and you separate your solvent by gravity and you extract your terpenes, the F solvent is ready to go back onto the culture. And so you can have a cyclic process where you're not losing any solvent in the process. So it's, it's really quite exciting. Yeah, I just got myself off of mute. Right. So I'll just move on to the next question. We have a lot of questions. So from Georges, we have a question. Uh, if we look 10 to 15 years in the future, do you think microalgae could become the chassis of choice for Synbio startups looking to produce high value compounds compared to bacteria or yeast, considering it only requires water plus NPKS from waste and sunlight? Could it make economic sense for most bioproductions? I think it will always be cheaper to use yeast fast or bacteria fast. Now, if we take a longer term view of the sustainability of something, algae make much more sense. And what we're working on now are intensification bioreactors that can get, you know, normally algae will grow to one gram per liter in large volume culture. And what we're really looking at is getting to the 5, 10 gram per liter range uh, of the biomass. If you're talking about most chemical industry that use yeast for biotechnology, the cutoff for economics for any process is 10 grams per liter product, not cell mass, but product. So if I'm making patchouli alcohol, I need to make 10 grams per liter patchouli alcohol for that fermenter to be cost-effective. Now, if I'm growing 10,000 liters of algal culture and it's continuous and I have a low energy process that I recycle all of my solvents and I can continually produce one gram per liter patrolol with a high density algal culture and I'm inputting CO2 and getting out algal biomass and a pigment that I can sell on the side, maybe that makes more sense. Um, it really comes down to what the future looks like in terms of incentivization for the business landscape, process timelines, requirements. I think it, it creates a, a niche, I think around here where resources are really expensive to get in, like to import sugar here, we have to import it by flying it in or on a ship, but we have tons of CO2. So geographically CO2 makes much more sense here, even though the yields might not be volumetrically or time-wise um favorable so i hope that answers your question actually that made me think of something else uh would would you say that as like public perception is also involved in this so like the public perception i think of algae might vary to like in comparison to bacteria and you think maybe that would help with the like development of that technology I like to hope so. I mean, it is a green cell chassis, right? Or once you start making keto carotenoids, it's a brown cell chassis. But at least people think of algae as a green cell chassis. Um, I definitely think we as consumers get the wool pulled over our eyes quite a lot because if I made terpenes from algae or yeast, I can sell them as natural products, even though they're completely synthetic. They're the same natural chemical, right? Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely something that does change consumer perception. When you say this perfume I made you is from algae, they say, wow, what? I don't understand. And their brain doesn't really get it because you have to go through 52 minutes of me speaking at you in a monotone voice before you understand what I'm talking about. And nobody has time for that except for you lovely people, so. Okay, cool. So uh, the next question is yeah, from, Mihris, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. What is the status of working with GMOs in Saudi Arabia? Indoors and in contained BSL level one labs, totally fine. 
we have make a hard cut between what's done outdoors for food and what's done for GM SynBio. And um, everything we do SynBio is in contained labs. In general, the rules are not yet defined, but we try to err on the side of safety. So the public is, what would the public's perception in Saudi Arabia be? Um, mixed, mixed. Um, you have a very large diverse, uh, sorry, um, a, you have a split in the population of a very high educated education level and very low education level. So um, it would come, it would be complicated to explain it to most of the population, but a lot of the population would get it, but it's easier just not to have that conversation. Yeah. Okay. And the next question from Andre uh, is curious if, oh yeah, similar regulations in hmm. regarding GM algae. And the next question is, in the cell lines shown with various YFP expression, there was a ring effect on the colonies. Is it due to expression on antibiotics higher towards the periphery? Expression of... Every subcellular localization gives a different colony picture. So if you have mitochondrial localization or cytoplasmic localization, those colonies look different. So some have a halo effect. Some do. There's no rhyme or reason to it. It's a property of the mass as a material and how the light fluoresces from it. Um, for sure, there's a variability of the fluorescence based on the dome shape of the colony. But yeah, it's more that's more art than science as far as I can tell. Okay, so when you say the algae bank from KSA to KSA dose, that means that KSA researchers can ask for pure isolates? Yes, absolutely. If you're at a university or doing research here, we will send you whatever strain we have. Just tell us the reference number from the document, um, which you can find either through my lab website or from the QR code that I, I put up there. But yes, we will send Pure isolate means that it's a monoculture, but there may be bacteria in there as well. It may not be exenic, but we do our best to get them as clean as possible. Okay, next question is, uh, what about the stability of the transformations when it comes to transforming the cells? And have you done any transformation in other eukaryotic algae? So in chlamydomonas, once the gene is in there, it's in there. Um, but the expression drops about 40% after six weeks, just because we maintain them by spreading on selecting plates. We don't freeze them. Um, and you get lower and lower gene expression because you select for, I mean, if there's any lowering of growth rate due to the expression of that gene or any hindrance of fitness, then the lower the expression, the more it's going to grow, right? So um, if we were doing large scale bioproduction of any of these products, we would probably continually transform and screen for whatever strain we wanted, and then just keep making new versions of that strain. So it's ready to go for production phase. In Cyanidio on Marole, there's almost no silencing that we can see. And once something's in there, it's super stable. So it's haploid, it's fantastic. It's, I think, going to be the future. So its genome is only uh, 16 megabase pairs. Chlamydomonas is 110. It has almost no introns. It does homologous recombination. Chlamydomonas does not. It has so many introns, really problematic. So I really think cyanidio is gonna be the model for biotechnology and algae moving forward. On that, uh, just to piggyback, I was wondering how, like to what extent is our reliance on you know model organisms and wanting to understand these well characterized systems limiting us from exploring like new potential organi model organisms like you said this new future model organism. It takes there's a huge barrier to entry to domesticating any new organism for biotechnology. So if you have a bug that grows really well, great. It may not take in transgenes very easily. If it is giving whatever property, it may have a really tough cell wall. Cell wall. So Galdieria, for example, is another one of these cyanidiophysiae that we only learned this year from a paper that came out from the Japanese group that works very heavily on it, that it has a sexual mating cycle that's stimulated by going to pH one from a pH two culture. Now, who would have thought of that, right? Like 
you have to you have to really understand that organism quite intimately to understand its lifestyle before you can start manipulating its genetics and so yeah we're a little beholden to organisms that people have done some characterization work on before and then you need a fully sequenced genome you need to understand promoters most algae don't take viral promoters they need their own promoters and you know the xyz there's so many steps to getting a strain ready for engineering and we're trying to engineer galdieri in our lab right now and it's it, we've succeeded but it's also very frustrating because we have expression of our transgenes and then it's gone two weeks later so we don't understand that at all and um any new organism you want to work with is a real uh challenge a very big barrier to entry there so yeah it's it's not easy just to jump in there does that mean that we should be spending more time and resources on the foundational like characterization of strains uh, worldwide as well as yes in, uh, absolutely Saudi Arabia. yeah yeah i mean characterization is one thing um fundamental phycology is another where you actually study the growth behavior and every day come in and make notes and draw what the cell looks like in a microscope and um, how it behaves to different stimuli yes absolutely we need more fundamentals so one of the things in my classes that i try and teach my students is doing biotechnology is really hard and it's really hard because you have to know everything that a fundamental biologist does and then try and mess up the system and see what happens and uh, then actually get something out of it right and so the skill sets required are really quite broad and you need many different specialists from many different fields to make it all work both for the upstream the bioreaction and the downstream of any bioprocess yeah i never thought of that actually yeah it is it is really hard um okay our next question is whether you have worked on optimizing any of the more fundamental processes of photosynthesis and carbon fixation so carbon carbon concentrating mechanisms as a way to increase production i have not um, I've been pretty focused on making terpenes from algae. I think those are really valuable things to do. Um, photosynthetic, uh, enhancing photosynthetic rates is great. I do not think that in any situation cells are limited in energy from photosynthesis. Enhancing the amount of the inner workings of the Calvin Benson Bassem cycle so that there's enough resources for carbon dioxide to be fixed faster is very important um, but even a co2 concentrating mechanism that has its application in a situation where you don't have on-site co2 so if you want to get the carbon dioxide from the air which is rather dilute rather than having injected co2 yeah having a very efficient ccm is very important but in the event that you're injecting co2 into your culture the ccm doesn't really matter anymore what matters is the um, design of the bubbles, the design of the reactor stirring, getting the carbon into, into the liquid, and then having that gas exchange into, into liquid is more important. So there's a lot of things that are actually more bioprocess engineering, where if you care about the biology, that's fantastic, and I think it helps, but in the practical world don't really matter. Right. So you can design a bioreactor to grow anything at any growth rate and you can optimize it and get it to be better and better. Um, but that's never been a focus of my work. OK. And so Eptial has made a media that improved algae growth so much, but uh, they're not sure how to make a paper about it and what they'd have to do to test it. Um, I don't know if they want to meet themselves or if they want to maybe contact you in a range. Sure. Yeah. They can, they can reach out by email. I, we'd be happy to chat. I mean, anybody in the kingdom, we're really happy to interact with. So um, that'd be great. Um, when you have an optimized media, you effectively just have to show growth rates uh, pre and post. It's helpful if you have some kind of nutrient analysis of at the end of cultivation that the nutrients you've given it are gone because let's say you make a, a medium that has a lot of nitrogen in it and at the end of your cultivation there's still a lot of nitrogen in it that's going to cause an algal bloom if it goes out into nature right so you don't you, you really need to make sure that your optimized medium is not creating more problems than 
then good. But if it's just, you know, we, we figured out, oh, it was deficient in copper and we added more copper and it grows really well. Fantastic. You should uh, try and try and show some optimized growth behaviors and, and then document that. Yeah. So the next question is, now that we have many genetic tools from for different algal species compared to a decade back, do you think going towards biofuel or biohydrogen production makes sense? Sorry, I just have to tell my wife we're still talking. <laughs> I said I'd be home by 10 and it's already 14 minutes to 10, so that's not going to happen. Um, <laughs> if you have to shoot, Carl, um, it's absolutely fine. We're just, uh, there's plenty of questions and uh, yeah, sure. we don't have to go through all of them. Um, biofuels are great in principle, but I'm not sure that they ever scale with our insatiable need for liquid fuels. Uh, how that need goes away, I don't know. But yeah, I think it only makes sense if you're making your biomass literally from treated wastewater. If you think about growing scales of algae that you need for biofuels, the fertilizer that we currently use to grow the crops that we eat will be completely exhausted. And I think that unless you are turning our wastewater into algal biomass and then using that for fuels, it doesn't make sense. Um, on the same token, uh, carbon sequestration with algae is actually sort of a misnomer. And the reason is that most of the carbon that goes into algal biomass ends up getting respired by whatever eats it at the end of the day. And when we're talking about the um, yield of biomass per input, uh, I'll give you an illustrative example. The best functioning algal field in the world right now or algal production facility will make 80 tons of algal biomass per year, per year. So 80 tons sounds like a lot. And it sounds like a lot also when you think about 30% of biomass, sorry, 30% of CO2 is carbon, 50% of biomass is carbon. And when you do the ratio of how much CO2 becomes that biomass, it means that for every kilo of algae you have, you have 1.82 kilos of CO2 that went into it. So we usually round up and say it's two to one. So 80 tons of biomass is 160 tons of CO2. Sounds like a lot, right? In a year, 160 tons. One flight from London to Jeddah will release 40 tons of CO2. So one year of algal farm, the size of a soccer field or a football field will make or put as much carbon dioxide as four flights, four, two round trip flights from London to Jeddah. So think about how many flights happen in the world in one day compared to one year of algal growth at a football size field. So we never really talk about algae as being used for carbon sequestration because we've been educated by all of the real industrial chemists and process designers here that really do carbon capture with cryogenic carbon capture, injecting it into the ground and turning it into minerals. And they're talking about millions of tons of CO2, right? Um, what we say is that algae use carbon dioxide for sure, but what they are are waste reuse vehicles. So you have nitrogen, you have phosphorus in waste streams. If carbon dioxide, it's a waste stream. You can turn that into higher order chemical value with algae. But for sure, you're not taking it at the scales that are needed for climate change. When the world figures out how to not burn fossil fuels and how to mitigate its energy balance in terms of emissions and, and use, algae will be a great way to produce stuff in a circular manner but they're not going to save the world at this point. So please keep that in mind. Well, I never I never knew that it was that small amount of carbon sequestration. Um, I mean, it sounds like great optics, right? Or it, it, it looks like great optics when you say, oh yeah, this green photosynthetic thing is gonna save the world. Now, people talk about growing massive, massive mats of marine macro algae in the middle of the ocean and then letting them sink to the, the bottom of the ocean? Maybe, maybe it'll work, I don't know. But um, I, at this point, any human activity that looks like 
some kind of engineering process or building something to do something will release more CO2 than we're sequestering. And that's the real problem, right? Um, yeah. So if not algae, then I guess there isn't really anything we can do about carbon sequestration with biotechnology other than the mats, but... It, it's one part of the spectrum of things that can use carbon dioxide, right? Okay. It's one part. It's not the holy grail. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do we want to continue or maybe... Yeah, of course. I, I can answer the remaining questions that are here. And I think that'll, that'll be it. So the... ORF de size dependency of the transgene. Do you have an explanation for that? I do have an explanation. It's not 100% documented by data. So what you're talking about is why do we need an intron every 450 base pairs in claiming? The evidence suggests because if you remove one of the introns, you don't have mRNA anymore. The evidence suggests that the introns function as a checkpoint for the uh, RNA polymerase as it's going down the gene. And it seems to be some kind of defense mechanism for foreign genes going into the genome. So, um, you know, green algae have existed as they are for a very long time without uh, changing. And they split from plants a long time before. So they evolved a little bit after they split from plants, but really didn't change that much after that. And they're so diverse all over the world. But Chlamydomonas specifically seems to use its introns as a, a myself versus other checkpoint in transcription of genes. And so when you have those introns there, the uh, polymerase stays on the gene the whole way instead of letting go halfway through. That's what we think. And next we have, sorry, are there any regulatory hurdles regarding the marketing of products such as Taxol produced by your methodology? Mm -hmm. Steve, um, Steve and I had a Zoom earlier today. I don't believe so. Taxol, once it's purified, is taxol, right? So it would be, in our case, taxidiene, which is a precursor um, diterpene. But uh, yeah, getting to taxol, you're just, at that point, it's synthetic chemistry. So there's no way you could tell it apart from any other taxol that you would produce. If the metabolic, metabolic pathway is too long, could it make sense to break it into to like on two different morales to alleviate the metabolic burden, sorry, metabolic burden, like some current research in bacteria. Two different. Probably, yeah. Um, that kind of co-culture of two strains. The problem is that the strains wouldn't dynamically regulate each other. So if one had a growth defect, one half of the pathway would dominate and then you would lose your um, final catalytic productivity. So maintaining two different cell populations in a bioreactor is very tricky and would have to somehow, like if one produced a metabolite that the other needed to survive and vice versa, they would keep each other in metabolic check while also doing your synthetic metabolism. But that's some pretty elegant engineering that I don't think anybody's doing at this point, but it's a very nice concept. If strain-directed evolution was applied to Merole in very high throughput, um, would this improve some of its less desirable characteristics? What would be those characteristics to improve first? There are no undesirable characteristics of Cimarole. <laughs> it's a beautiful organism. It's the most beautiful organism I've ever seen. Um, I don't know. We'll have to figure it out. So Cimarole secretes lactate. Um, and when the culture is dense, it smells like sort of grassy milk. Um, and one of the kind of weird things about these acidophiles is that they're highly sensitive to weak acids. So you can imagine at pH 2 that if you're a weak acid, you become fully protonated. You become fully, um, yeah, pr protonated. And weak acids are able to penetrate cell membranes just by passive diffusion. So now all of a sudden you have a situation where you're going from pH two to the cytoplasm, which is pH seven. And at that, you release all of the, uh, any, any protons that are uh, bound to you in that state. And so weak acids actually kill acidophiles very uh, aggressively. Um, so if you, so, Minimonis grows on acetic acid, which is vinegar. Um, so vinegar, you know, salt and vinegar chips, acetic acid, Chlamydomonas loves it. It will eat it all day, every day. But you put a little bit of acetic acid in the Cimarole culture and it's dead like that. But it can grow in pure, in sulfuric acid and at pH zero, right? So it's, it's kind of counterintuitive. Um, I don't know if there's a genetic way 
to change that. I think that's a physical problem. Um, but getting rid of the lactate secretion, for example, may keep more resources in the cell that we can then carbon channel to our product and lactate at too high concentration will also kill the cells. So, uh, you know, maybe, maybe those kind of things, but that maybe we can just do by targeted knockout of certain pathways using homologous recombination. So it's something to think about, um, maybe improving the growth rate. It doubles every nine hours. If we can get that down to six, that would be a game changer too. Okay, I think that wraps up all of the questions in the chat. Thank you so much for staying on. I uh, just wanted to end with a final just question for everyone to think about. Um, so if you had to choose one product, what would you also what would you like to see scaled up um, as an algal product in the market? Feel free to share if you want or just think about it. It can be terpenes. Yeah, thank you so much, Kyle. It was uh, super insightful. And uh, you've killed all of my hopes and dreams about uh, sustainable biofuels production. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry yeah. about that. Christmas I mean, came early. <laughs> I mean, maybe. Uh, so there are classes of um, lipids with uh, cyclic propane groups. And cyclic propane groups are more constrained than regular alkane chains. So they have more energy per molecule. They exist in certain organisms and you can theoretically engineer them into the lipids of organisms. So if you can make a super energy dense fuel, maybe you can drive your car longer, maybe you need less, but I mean, the economics on that sound uh, kind of wishy-washy to me. Uh, even saying it out loud, I feel kind of dirty, but maybe. Who knows? Um, yeah, if if we, we got have you enough, on camera, uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> if we have enough wastewater treatment, maybe we can have some small sources of biofuels that are produced from algae. But um, it it requires some intensification of the processes for sure. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Okay, awesome, cool. Thanks so much again. This was really really inspiring. I think I speak on behalf of all the audience and. Yeah, if you'd like to let us get let us um, share your contact details to be able to contact you, then we'll do that. And sure, I I get a lot of really random contact requests on LinkedIn. So if I don't accept it, it's not that I don't like you. It's just that I don't tend to accept them unless I've met you somehow in a meeting or in person. So um, don't feel offended. Send me mm -hmm. a message to say specifically I saw your talk, and then maybe maybe it'll work a little better yeah cool so have a great evening and thank you so much if you want to get involved in Dali Dao, scan this qr code and we'll happily welcome you it's a great community you grow a lot and get inspired so yeah thanks everybody it was really fun see you thanks guys bye Uh, you can stop the recording now.